have been just her. Yeah. Yeah, that's why my, uh, that was my understanding. Yes. It was so secretive, the whole thing. And it has a better keyboard. I found out about the four finalists when they came And to the it has mm. MagSafe. Yeah. yeah. The which is better. Center, which is better. Yeah. Okay. So you should let me know when to do As you like it. I think we can start day three. Thanks for coming back. Uh, today you got Ani Adhikari, who is just an amazing Star. intellectual author of the entire project, uh, has been there from the beginning, <laughs> has won teaching awards over and over and over, uh, is like an inspirational force to countless undergrads entering this realm. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for being here. Th just thank you for taking three days, four days of your time. Um, I am all too aware of how little time you have, so thank you very much for this. Um, let me say a little bit about uh, what I plan to do today uh, and the assumptions that I'm making. If those assumptions are false, I'm relying on you to stop me uh, when uh, things don't make sense. So. Uh, over the past couple of days, you've got a general and in some cases a particular sense of how we encourage the students to think about data and in particular about sampling variability. And in the end, they're going to make conclusions based on data that they see. And if they make conclusions based on uh, large random samples, and I hope they do that uh, wherever <laughs> possible, because those large random samples will resemble the populations about which they are going to make conclusions. Then uh, they can make a conclusion based on their one random sample, but they have to always be aware that that sample could have come out differently. And therefore, they need to think about how different that sample and whatever it is they are computing could have been. This is a mind game that they have to play. And in classical data analysis classes, this was done with mathematics, right? So you have your sample, and you do something very natural with that sample. But now that number might have been different. How different might it have been? In an introductory class with very few prerequisites, we would say, well, wonderful mathematicians have found out <laughs> that it might have been this far off. <laughs> and then anybody who has made any attempt to teach introductory data analysis to students will know that this is the moment where the eyes glaze over. <laughs> right? This is where the square roots come in. <laughs> the wonderful thing for us with this computing environment is that we can say, all right, so you have this one sample and you have this one natural thing that you've computed, but your sample could have been different. How different could it have been? You can simply draw another sample and do the same natural thing on that one, and then just do that over and over and over again, right? And you've seen this, I think, in two different settings, uh, yesterday and on Monday, so just uh, coming in as a third instructor, I'm just gonna be trying to intuit what my um, colleagues did before. So you, uh, yesterday, did you do the Swain versus Alabama jury trial? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? And so there was a situation in which, if you assume the jury is being drawn at random, then it is being drawn at random from a population where 26% are black and uh, uh, the remainder are not. And so you can simply draw from that population over and over again and see what you should have got if you had done that. Right? So that I will refer to as simulation. That is, you know exactly the population from which you are drawing and you just draw. Um, I'm, not, I'm hoping that we'll have time to get to another setting where you have you know, a um, a sample of some numbers, and I forget, did you do flight delays? Mm -hmm. yeah, what yeah. did you do? Okay, so you have a random sample of flight delays, and you've computed a median flight delay from it. And uh, I think it was, if the data set was United Airlines, yeah. that median delay was pretty small. I mean, we grumble a lot about United Airlines, but I mean, I looked at those data, I said, eh, okay, give them a break. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but the thing is, that sample could have been different. And the wonderful, brilliant idea of Brad Ephraim in the 1970s, actually, was to say, okay, I need another sample. 
I can't go back to the population. I can't go back to the population because I don't have the resources. It costs money to go back to the population, right? But I need another sample. What can I do? Well, why did I take a large random sample in the first place? It is because I'm hoping that it looks like the population. So let me treat this large random sample as my population and draw from it over and over again. And then I should get lots of different samples that kind of, with high probability, I hope, look like the population. And then I can play my game over and over again. Right? That's, that is what we call uh, resampling or the bootstrap. Um, and so at this point of the class, the students are very familiar with these ideas. Um, and so we like to finish the term with two major applications. Um, and that is to prediction. And that is you know, one, uh, something that the data scientist wants to do, which is make a prediction uh, for a new individual about some quantity that you don't know. And so um, here's what I'm hoping to do today. Uh, is I want to talk a little bit in general about uh, the two areas, the two kinds of predictions that we do and the similarities between them. And then I want to get into um, what is called regression. And I want to show you the, the, how we develop it for students. Uh, we have asked for no prerequisites whatsoever, right? And our aim always is to tell a good story where the student can see that they're learning something important with very little heavy machinery. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so that will be uh, up to the break, which is at about 10. And then uh, when we come back from the break, we'll use what we've learned about regression to do some predictions based on a regression model. And I'll talk a little bit about models at that stage. And once we've done that, we'll do the other kind of prediction um, uh, that is uh, classification. And I'll talk about uh, what that means. Right. So that's kind of my plan. However, this is a group of colleagues. And if the plan doesn't work for you, I'm relying on you to tell me. <laughs> right? Because I can adjust on a dime. I, the, the, the point is that you should get what you need, uh, not just I should wrap it on endlessly. So please uh, stop me and um, whenever you wish, right? for whatever you wish. OK. Um, so uh, the main topic of today is prediction. And uh, so what is the goal of prediction? And here, you know, there are predictions of vast subject for data eight. We consider the setting in which there is some population of individuals. And uh, you want to make a prediction about some variable related to those individuals. Um, and you have some data. You have data on some of them, but not all of them. So you, you have your data on some of them, and you uh, understand lots of variables about these people. But then along comes a new person. And you want to make a prediction for that new person. That's the image that our students have. Um, and so the goal is for a new individual. Uh, you want to predict the value of a particular variable, which we will call the response based on uh, what you've observed of other variables. And these other variables, the ones that you can see and uh, observe, we will call attributes or features. OK, so here you are. You have to make a prediction uh, for somebody based on the data that you already have. And we do it all the time. A student walks into our office hours. Right? And we are trying to predict what question is this person going to ask, or where is this person going to get stuck? And what we do instantly in our heads is we think back over our, you know, hundreds of students that we have known, or thousands in my case, um, which, and say, okay, you know, these people were similar. They got stuck here. I think this person is going to get stuck here. You basically, you look for people in your experience who are similar, and you make your prediction based on that. And that's what we're going to do. So the approach is to start with individuals for whom you have already observed both the attributes and the response, right? So your historical set of students where you knew where they got stuck. Identify those who are similar to the new ones. You have to define what is similar. Uh, and then use their typical or average response as your prediction. That's the um, overarching uh, plan that we have. 
And I'd like to explain these two words. Both of these are prediction problems of exactly the sort that we uh, just discussed. Um, in the case of regression, the response variable is numerical. Right? So maybe you're trying to predict somebody's income or a national GDP or something. It's a number that you are trying to predict based on other attributes. I should say that in data eight, attributes, the variables that you observe, that you use uh, to base your prediction on, these are all numerical. Maybe they were once categorical and somebody has coded them appropriately. Therein lies a minefield. But uh, <laughs> uh, all the attributes are uh, numerical. OK, so you find those whose attributes remember, uh, resemble the new persons. And now you look at the response of that similar group. Those responses are all numbers, right? So numerical variables. So uh, you have the incomes of the similar group. And you just take the average of those incomes and say, that's my prediction for this new person. That's a very natural thing to do. Now, there may be other better things to do. But this is a natural thing to do. And this is what we're going to do. OK, so that's regression. In the case of classification, the response is categorical. Uh, so the response is not a number. It's a label. Uh, so it may be if your uh, um, data, are, if your individuals are transactions that Amazon is doing, uh, then the categories could be this is fraudulent or this is not, right? Or if it's uh, um, your individuals are voters, then the response could be you know which party are they going to vote for, right? So it's not a number; it's, it's a it's a category, also known as a class. Okay, hence classification. So what we will do is we will find, in our historical data set, in our experience, we will find those that resemble this new person. Those people have some typical or common class, and we will make our prediction the most common class of this group. And obviously, here also, there are some details to attend to. What do I mean by most common and so on? But for now, just imagine that you have uh, two classes, fraud, not fraud and that you have an odd number of individuals so that there is a majority class. And we're just going to pick the majority class of those who are like this new individual that we have. OK? So does the plan make sense? Mm -hmm. OK, so we are now going to execute this mm -hmm. plan. I will start with regression. Um, and I'll spend most of my time on regression and the last hour uh, on classification. Okay. So here, as an instructor, I have to decide how to tell the story. What is the beginning of the story? What's the middle? What's the end? What's the punchline? And you know, when we teach, we have uh, in the background decades of experience with the subject. The subject started out a certain way, but then it's developed in various ways. And what we present to the student is not necessarily the, in fact, very often not, the historical sequence. Right? We present in whatever sequence happens to be appropriate for that setting. There are times, however, and this is one of them, where understanding the historical sequence actually helps you get to the heart of it. And so there are moments in data eight where we have been very careful to explain to the students that all this stuff is not new. Right? This, these ideas and these ways of thinking are not new. We start with the John Snow and the cholera epidemic in 1850s London. Uh, yesterday, perhaps, you saw Sir Ronald Fisher's approach to hypothesis testing. Yes? And uh, in, uh, when it comes to regression, uh, <coughs> somehow understanding how it developed helps understand what it does. And so, if I can ever move my slide. What? Ha, after 17 clicks, <laughs> I, I'm going to start with the origins of regression. And the origins of regression are with this man. Darwin's cousin, brilliant, brilliant scientist, 
and in my view, a poor excuse for a human being. Uh, see that last bullet, right? So this guy was interested in breeding Superman. Um, and so, well, you know, did a ton of work, got a ton of data. And um, let me now show you some of the data that he got at the moment so that you can actually see this thing. Okay, this is your lecture notebook number three. Uh, those of you who are following along, if you go to Galton's data, this cell right here, and run all above, then you will have um, the definitions of various uh, graphics routines and so on that I've done. Okay, let's take a look at Galton's data. People in the back, should I make this bigger? Yes. Yes? Okay. How's that? Bigger still? One more? All right. Okay, so t t take a look at this table. You have seen tables, yes, uh, before, right? Okay. One of the things, I don't know if it's point been pointed out, is that this class has a motto. And the motto is visualize, then quantify. First, look at what you've got in an intelligent way. And the table is our first visualization. Yes. I just want to let you know I get, uh, but I could have done it wrong. I get name error. Yes. Oh yeah. Me too. I got it to work. I have to get lots of errors. Can I see? Today I got it to work. Yeah. <laughs> What's the name? Oh. oh. Antonio, this is the way of the world. <laughs> go back to the beginning. Go to the top. Did you run all the ones? I you did. You run all those. Okay. You have to run all of those first. Okay. So, okay. So, which is because you had me. I wrote something that said run all above. Yeah, run all above. Yeah. And you're like, right? So, so if you are getting late error, go here. I should have taught him that by day three. No, you did. Go to cell, go to run Repetition all above, is and then start no new learning. Learning. Repetition for new learning. Repetition is required for new learning. <laughs> they learn from their mistakes and get older. Yes, that's what I said. So yeah. this, this is our first visualization, 934 rows, right? So there was this man getting data on a lot of individuals, and each row here corresponds to one adult who is called a child because uh, the data are to do with their parents' heights, okay? Uh, and so the, the response is the height of the child. That's the last column, and it's in inches. Now, then there are various attributes of this child. Uh, first is which family they're in. So you see there are four, four children in the first family, and so on and so forth. All good? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then father's height, mother's height, mid-parent height is a kind of average of mothers and fathers, mm -hmm. not the simple average. He weighted the mother's uh, uh, heights a little bit more for reasons that I won't go into right now. <laughs> but it is a combination of uh, uh, the, um, the two heights. Then there's number of children in the family. And then there is child number. I believe this is uh, birth order. Uh, and then gender and uh, the height of the child. So what we're going to do is we are going to do what Galton did, and we're going to try and look at the child's height in relation to the mid-parent height, right? The average height of the parents, what is the relation between these two? Um, let me just say, uh, just to get a sense of uh, who's in the room, uh, how, how many of you have used, taught, or been involved with regression in any way. Okay, so there's a, yeah, fair, there's a, a, fair, a fair number have had some experience with this. Right? What I'd like you to observe is the form of this table. Right? Each row corresponds to an individual. And so if you look along a row, you are seeing a particular child and all of their attributes. Technically, a row, therefore, is not an array. There are some numbers, there are some cat categories, and so on and so forth. It was very important for us that the student distinguish the row from the column. Right? The row is everything to do with one person. The column, let's look at the gender column, is one attribute across all people. 
And those of you who have done or taught multiple regression will recognize this is exactly the form in what in statistics is called the design matrix. But each row corresponds to an individual and each column corresponds to a variable. Right? So uh, you know, from day one, students are used to thinking in these terms. And it's quite helpful now uh, to, um, to, um, to visualize. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to. A, a quick yes. question. Yes, of course. And do you have the, the database in that format since the beginning? Or yes. Or try to create that in that way? So we have a CSV file. We have a, and in the background, there's a comma separated values file. It's just an ordinary text file, right? Oh, and that's it has, order. yes, in, the, in exactly this order. Yeah. Yes. And that file, uh, you have access to it. This is the file galton.csv. You can go take a look. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just going to reduce to uh, the two columns that I care about. Um, however, um, the wonderful thing about being able to hand the students the data is when you do an analysis, somebody always raises their hand and said, well, if you just did it with the father's height, then what would happen? <laughs> and now you can tell them, well, do it. I haven't actually done it, but uh -huh. could you please do it and tell me? Uh -huh. And so this is a student who is in their first semester of freshman year, and they have learned a couple of very important things. One is that the professor knows a lot, but doesn't know everything. <laughs> and two, that the data are theirs. They own the data. They can do anything they want with it. Nothing is being hidden. And moreover, they can find something interesting and come and tell this grand professor who's standing at the lectern. <laughs> right? And this m creates a very nice relationship in the class. With 1,500 students, you have this relationship essentially of some kind of collegiality. Mm. Right? And that has been a real liberation for me in, in teaching, with the students as well as the young staff. Okay. So let's actually do what we're supposed to do here. Um, so Galton did this. He drew a picture. He visualized before he quantified. And so now along comes a new child, right? And somehow Galton knows their mid-parent height. And supposing their mid-parent height was right here, Galton wants to predict the height of this child. So we're just going to do it. Okay. So uh, that's our goal. Uh, we are going to be given a mid-parent height, and we are going to predict the height of the child. OK, supposing the mid-parent height is 68 inches, OK? You want to predict the height of the child. Then you know that this point will have a mid-parent value of 68. So it's going to be somewhere here. So you have to identify which children were similar to this one. And those were the children whose mid-parents' heights are around 68. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now you get to define around. We just chose it to be uh, within half an inch. Uh, but you can define it to be within a quarter of an inch or whatever you like. We just defined it. So this vertical strip consists of the points. Uh, the heights consist of the heights of all the children with similar parents to the new person. And so your prediction is the average of those heights in that strip. right? And you're placing that prediction at mid-parent height equals 68, because that's the person's mid-parent height. OK, so far? Mm -hmm. So what we are going to do is we are going to say, if the person's mid-parent height was 70, then we are going to look at all the people whose mid-parents height were around 70, figure out their average, and use that as our prediction. Notice, very low overhead. You have table. You have this value, which is the mid-parent height. You extract from the table all the rows where the mid-parent height is within half an inch of what you're given. And you compute the average of those children's heights. Right? This is a manageable sequence of steps. And having done that, that is the curve, that is what you get, right? Mm -hmm. So mid-parent height of 70, that's your prediction. Mid-parent height of 68, this was the prediction that we drew, and so on. We've done it for every single mid-parent height along here, and we have plotted our predictions. This is what Galton did, right? So he had this sense that I'm going to just take the average of similar people. And it was Galton who saw the line. 
but you, you can see the, these points, it's, they're a little wobbly, but they're following a line. Right? He was curious about that line. Um, I should tell you that this happens in data eight very, very early, uh, about week four. We use it as a way for students to get a workout in table and array methods. Right, you've got a table, you extract these rows, you take the average, and then you do that for every single value on the x-axis, and then you plot. It is a thorough workout <laughs> in all of the methods, and we have been very sneaky. We have always known where we're, we want to end up, and the examples in the beginning have led to that. So we do this very early, about fourth week, they're doing this. And I can tell you, when this graph, and we actually compute this, of course, when this graph shows up and you have hundreds and hundreds of people in the room, the gasp that goes through the room <laughs> is just memorable. It's <laughs> unforgettable. It's a, oh. OK, so now the question is, what is this line? We're going to identify the line, right? Uh, so let me go back to my notebook and, okay, so what is this line? Well, so that's the line and you can get it by um, fit line equals true. Okay, that's the line, but you know, what is it? Where did it, how can I, if I have the data, how can I figure out what that line is? Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is to look at that scatter diagram. In fact, look at the one above it that has no line. Now that Galton has shown you that somewhere there's a straight line through that, do you agree that it kind of looks linear? Mm -hmm. And that also you don't really care exactly what numbers are on the horizontal axis or on the vertical axis. You just know the shape is roughly linear. Yeah? So the fact that you have inches on both sides or the fact that you have something like, you know, in the 60s, it doesn't matter. It could have had minus 400 to 1700 there. If the picture was the same, it would still be linear. And this is an important observation because we're trying to get the students to just get rid of all unnecessary detail. The numbers on the scales don't matter. And this is going to be particularly important when you start predicting things that are, uh, like you predict income based on years of education, then on the horizontal axis you have years, and on the vertical axis you have uh, dollars. Right? And then things are not commensurate. So the idea is, okay, can we just sort of get rid of all these units of measurements and come up with one common unit, uh, one common way of measuring all data, all numerical data? And I won't go into that in great detail. That is called standard units, and it has a simple idea, which is every numerical data set has an average. Yeah? Just call that your zero. Right? Call that your zero. So you stand at the average. And because you're standing at the average, you have data on both sides. Right? And all you have to do to define your scale is to define a unit in which you will walk. Right? One unit on this side, one unit on this side. And once you define that unit, then your scale is set. That unit is called the standard deviation of the data, the typical si size of how far off you are from average. So in class, we will have gone through this measure. Right? And they will know that you can look at any data set as I stand at the average, and I walk in units of standard deviations on either side. Mm -hmm. So zero is the average. One is one standard deviation above average. Minus one is minus one standard deviation above average, which is one standard deviation below average, and so on. And we go through, and there's a marvelous, marvelous result by a Russian mathematician called Chebyshev that says no matter how awful the shape of your distribution, and you can do your worst, uh, the bulk of the data are going to be in the range average, plus or minus, a few standard deviations. He makes this precise. And so really, if you know the average and the standard deviation of a list of numbers, you have a really good sense of where the data are. And you may be off a bit in the tails, but the bulk of the data you can get a handle on. So the students will be used to this. And so the students will be used to then the standard unit scale. And I'm just going to draw you a picture of an oval scatter diagram, right? So we had roughly, Galton had roughly an oval scatter diagram. I've drawn you an oval scatter diagram. But now look at the scales on the horizontal axis. She says zero on the center. 
right? And then, you know, one, two, three, not many on, uh, on either side. One, two, three, four on either side. And now the two scales are the same. So for both, the average is the center, and you are measuring in units of estimate. <coughs> Great. Well, then the picture is symmetric. I'm trying to identify what is the best line to put through it. A very natural line is the 45 degree line. Yeah, I have a completely symmetric picture. I'm going to put a line that goes right to the center of it. So let's see if that's the right line to use. Well, OK, so what are we going to try to do? Our goal is going to be somebody's going to give me an x. Supposing they tell me that this x was at 1.5 units, that's one and a half standard deviations above average. So this is an above average person. I have to predict y. What did we say we were going to do? We were going to look at all the people roughly in this strip and pick off their center. Yes, that's what we said we were going to do. Now, if I look at this strip, does this point here look like the center to you? It does not. It is visibly too high. Yeah, wrong line. It is a natural line because this line says if I'm at this rank on x, right, then I'm at the same rank on y. Right, so given a certain uh, um, given a certain value of x on this scale, this line says predict the same value of y, but our picture says that prediction is wrong. So what should the prediction be? Well, the prediction should be here's my x. Look at this vertical strip and pick off its center, and that's right here. Yes, that is below the red line. And if you play the same game here, if, my, if I was at minus 1.5, then this would be too low. I should actually be predicting this. Yes. And you can do that throughout. And at every stage, pick off the centers of the vertical strips of that oval. And that gives you the green line. That's the line you use for prediction. Question. Yes. So this is data that I'm simulating. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to explain to you how we are going to uh, calculate a regression line. What, I, what, uh, what I'm trying to do is to just show that it's a fact of geometry, really. It doesn't have to do with the fact that Galton was measuring heights or anything else. It has to do with the oval. So but my point is this like, trial line. Yes. Um, can you enter that code into a cell that corresponds to some data set that's behind uh, it? That corresponds to, you know, I told you to, at the start, run all above. Mm -hmm. There is a vast array of functions that I have defined. Okay. And so what happens in class is we have these, and they are hidden from the students. Okay. And so there are, I don't want them to be focusing on the graphics, because graphics code is very long. It was tremendously intimidating, and you think you've learned something very hard. But what, all I'm asking them to do is to say, the line that you should use is flatter than the 45 degree line. That's all I'm asking them to observe. Yeah, I'm asking because yeah. I wanted to say, oh, guys, look at this thing. I don't yeah. know where that came from. So I was like, oh, does this live somewhere? Oh, no, no, oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank yeah, I'm sorry, you. I should have explained. No, no, thank you. Yes. Just real quick. Um, you, I, I like the way you sort of graphically, pun intended, uh, indicate how you get to either side of the, the zero there by taking one step. Yes. Which we get, that's, that's really neat pedagogically, I think. How is that step defined? The, this uh, standard deviation, there's some mathematical way to do that? So the standard, the, stand, you know, the standard deviation has a very precise definition that we give to the students. You have your data set, you have its average. right? You're trying to get a sense of roughly how far off the numbers are from average. So you just, for every number you compute, how far it is from average. right? Number minus average. Now, some, those are called deviations. Some of those are positive, some of those are negative. Right? If you simply average them, you will end up with zero, because the plus deviations will exactly cancel out the negative deviations. So to get rid of the cancellation, you square them. You take the average of those, and you take the square root. And so we will have, we'll have done all of this. And you will see this way of approaching errors um, shortly. Okay, if I ever, yes, uh, shortly. <laughs> yes. The, it's very elegant how you've taught them to take away all the units. Yeah. But I spend all my time getting them to put units back on. We will, so in just a moment. You... We will, in just okay. a moment. Okay. Um, okay. So now there is something very interesting that has happened. 
the slope of the red line, the 45 degree line, you agree is one. Yeah, the, uh, however much you go over, you have to go up exactly that much to hit your line. The slope is one. So the slope of the line that you are going to use for prediction is less than one. Yes, it's positive the way I've drawn it, but it is less than one. It is a fraction. It is between zero and one. That is a very important fraction in data analysis. That fraction is the correlation. And here, the history really matters. Galton had this picture. And he understood about, you know, the, uh, that this line is a slightly flatter line than he would have liked. But he couldn't figure it out. He did, wasn't a mathematician. So he asked Carl Pearson, who was his friend, and said, what is going on here? And it is Carl Pearson who came up with the value of this slope. And that is a fraction. And he called it the correlation coefficient. It's called Pearson's R, mm -hmm. uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient. And it happened here when he was trying to figure out what is happening with this sort of dampening effect that you're getting um, in regression. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw you a few pictures um, by my some old calculation that I remember the correlation here is about a third. And so I'm going to show you. This is simulated data. You've got an oval correlation, a third. Uh, that is the line uh, that you shouldn't use, and the green line is the line that you should use. Okay? Uh, now, I have drawn these pictures with the scatter always sloping up. But of course, you could play the same game with the scatter sloping down. So I will make this negative. <laughs> right? And then the green line, is, so that's where your predictions are. Uh, let me go back to 0.33 and show you what happens if instead of 0.33, you go to 0.93. Okay, really large fraction. Right, they're almost the same. And so is in this sense, and if I, I don't know if my, I don't know how fine I can get here. Eh. Okay, you can hardly see the difference between the red line and the green line, right? And in this sense, what you're seeing is that correlation measures the amount of clustering about the straight line. Right, that's that's uh, kind of visualization of uh, what we tell them. Okay. Um, Can I ask you? Yes. Um, teach them, like, how to interpret that number? Oh, absolutely. For everyone Ab oh, ab okay. absolutely. We will have gone over how do you interpret the slope? How do you before that? Mm -hmm. What is a correlation? Uh, mm -hmm. How should you use it? How should you not use it? Mm -hmm. What you should watch out for? There is a very famous picture that you should look at in our textbook where some. Somebody has kindly drawn a scatter diagram of, for every nation, the amount of chocolate consumption per capita on one side and the uh, number of Nobel Prizes per capita on the other side. <laughs> and uh, it's a straight line and R is 0.7 something and Switzerland wins. And uh, <laughs> no surprise, this is a Swiss scientist who did this. I, I still, people haven't been able to figure out if this guy was serious. There have been some very harumphing uh, reviews written of this uh, paper. Uh, I, I think that was a Swiss team with a, a superb sense of humor. Okay, all right, so we have the line. And let's go and see what we have. Uh, so this picture, actually, I got ahead of myself. This picture is called the graph of averages, right? For every value of x, you have the average value of y that you're plotting. This picture is called the graph of averages. Um, and so those are your predictions. Those in the case of the oval scatter diagram, it follows roughly a line, and that line is called the regression line. Why regression? I'll explain in just a moment. Okay, but this is what Galton did, and Pearson came up with a slope, and uh, if the scatter diagram is football shaped, we've actually, well, we've actually figured out what that line is. Uh, and so, if you have an x, 
and you're trying to estimate a y. Your first rule is convert to standard units, right? Go to the zero, one scale. Convert the given x to standard units, right? Now, what's the <coughs> equation of your line? The green line goes through the origin, yes? Mm -hmm. So it has no intercept, no y-intercept. So the equation is of the form y equals some slope times x, right? And we just said the slope was r. So you take your x that is in standard units, you multiply it by the correlation, and you're done. Game over. You have made your prediction, except it's in standard units, mm -hmm. right? It's that many SDs above the average of y. Well, fine. So figure out that many SDs plus the average of y. Change units, and you've got your prediction. That is a data age regression prediction. Okay. Now, of course, you can automate this. You can. Uh, we have a picture of you know. There's the <coughs> picture in standard units. There's the picture in the original units, and you can see quickly what is the formula for the slope and the intercept in the original units. So we do that as well. Uh, but really, the heart of regression is the game that is played in standard units. Take what you got in standard units, multiply by r, and you're done. That's your regression pitch. Uh, except for Galton, this was most annoying. Okay. <laughs> The guy is a eugenicist, and uh, they are interested in breeding Superman. And uh, one of the things I have noticed as a short person is that everyone who wants to breed Superman wants to breed for height. <laughs> Apparently, it's good to be tall or whatever. OK, so what Galton did was he looked at the parents. Actually, this is a, a classic father-son data set that he used. And he looked at the fathers that were quite a bit above average in height. And so if you imagine in one generation, there's not a big difference, not a big change in the averages, the averages and SDs overall, right? If you imagine all the six foot tall fathers and you have them stand in a line in front of you, if you run a ruler over the tops of their heads, that ruler is gonna run exactly level. Yep. Now have in front of each man his son. Run your ruler over the tops of their heads, then that ruler is gonna wobble. Right, because their sons aren't going to be exactly all the same height. So what he's saying is, what's the average of the sons' heights? Right, and here you are. Here are all the very tall fathers right here. And the average of the sons' height is, OK, for my picture, there are two standard deviations above average fathers. But my prediction is only about one standard deviation above average for the sons. Right, what he wanted was that the prediction should be here or preferably even taller, right? He wanted the tall to get taller. But what he noticed was that no matter what, if you are above average in one variable, then on average, the prediction is going to be not quite that much above average on the other, right? There's the other side, too. And if you look at the very short fathers, then you will be predicting their sons to be somewhat taller than them. He did not care. He probably thought those people shouldn't be breeding, <laughs> right? But this guy is looking at the tall fathers, and they are not meeting his needs. Right? He wants their sons to be at least as tall as them, and on average, they are not. And so we have, uh, that's your, uh, that's your uh, equation. You have a given x. That is some number. When you multiply by a fraction, you get a smaller number. Right, you got a number that's closer to zero. And uh, so on average, the values of y at a fixed x are closer to the mean than x is. Right? Now, I should say that it is not true that everybody is here on this trip. Some people, <laughs> some sons of tall fathers can be very tall. Right? Some can be extremely short by the standards of these sons, but on average, they're going to be about here. So uh, the, the line is picking off an average. It is not making a statement about every single individual in that strip. Uh, uh, but uh, Galton was not happy. And he wrote a paper in this unhappy state. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun finding a picture of him looking faintly disgusted. <laughs> 
And the title of the paper. <laughs> Regression towards mediocrity is in the title of that paper, and that word has stuck. Right, but it is exactly the right idea. It is, you know, you start out above average, and the prediction is, yes, still above average, but a little bit less. Yeah? So this is the story that we tell people in data eight about regression. It is not a story that I dreamed up. Uh, I owe a lot to, in fact, this entire enterprise. <laughs> At the end of the day, I will take a few moments to explain to you this thing, which in my experience is actually truly transformative. That word is not being overused here. Uh, why did this happen at Berkeley and not at Harvard or UCSD or Yale or any of those other places? After all, their data analysts and computer scientists are also as wonderful as ours, right? They, why here? And there are reasons for that, very sharp reasons, which I will explain later. So now you understand at least where that term came from. Um, and um, <coughs> what regression is, not understanding this dampening is called the regression fallacy. And there are numerous famous examples, a classic one being in baseball, every year a player is selected as the rookie of the year. Major League Baseball, this is the uh, player who has had the best results that year in some sense. So that player, and actually the press follow these players, right? And they look at what they did the following year. Well, guess what? Freaking On freaking average, freaking. they don't do as well as they did in that first year. And the press is all over them. You, 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 you know, too many endorsements, you started to coast, you this, that, and the other. It's none of that. It's just the regression effect, <laughs> right? If you are way at the top on one variable, then for the other, you have nowhere else to go but down. <laughs> right, and so this is something I tell my students after the midterm. <laughs> right, that if you didn't do very well, if you change nothing, regression is predicting you'll do slightly better. <laughs> right, so take that to heart. And if you did extremely well, try to beat the regression effect. Right, pull up your socks, do something. Um, okay, no more stories. I will uh, behave myself and. Uh, talk about the best line. And here, one of the things that is none number of you will have been thinking, OK, this is all very well. I see it in the scatter diagrams and oval, but not all scatter diagrams are oval. right? So if it's not an oval, then what? So what we are going to do is we are going to observe something really remarkable, which is no matter what the shape of the scatter diagram, so you have a scatter diagram that looks like a banana or like a snake. And for some reason, best known to yourself, you decide you're going to fit a straight line to that, right? Well, OK. The good news for you is that there actually is one best straight line. There are not multiple best straight lines. There is one best among all straight lines. I'll define best in just a moment, right? And you can calculate it. You shouldn't use it. Uh, but you know, it's a free country. I can't stop you. <laughs> Um, and so let us take a look at, um, these are data that David Wagner's friend, um, David Wagner's friend um, gathered for himself. Okay, so we can see what the line is when the scatter diagram is oval. The astonishing thing is the exact same equation works. Uh, no matter what the shape of the scatter diagram. And so here is uh, the line I, as photographed by David Wagner's friend, I'm not sure, the checkout line. And what they're interested in is uh, how you make a decision about which line to go in. Do you go to the line where there's lots of people with small numbers of items, or do you go where there's one cart with lots of items? And they took some data of their own. and. Uh, uh, for themselves, I think they measured the number of seconds it took for them to check out depending on the number of items, right? So uh, our, our, our friends are just as nerdy as we are. <laughs> they're standing in the Safeway line and they're counting their thing and they're looking at the stopwatch or whatever. Uh, okay. Um, and so 
So these are uh, the data. On this day, they had 39 items, and they took 236 seconds, and so on. And so if I look at the scatter diagram, the scatter diagram looks like that. Now, that's eh, roughly linear, right? But it is not oval. It's flaring, right? So our oval picture doesn't quite do the job here. OK. So uh, uh, the data science library just does tell us what the so-called best line is, and we're just going to try to look at its equation just by staring at it. Okay, so uh, from 20 to 30, you're going over 10, right? And uh, to you're getting to, I should use this, I'm not here. You're getting to here, this is 100, this is 150 degrees, this is maybe about around 130, right? So you've gone over 10, here and you've gone up about 30, so the rise over around 30 divided by 10 slopes about three. Yeah. Um, so we're going to guess that the slope is about three. The intercept is this value here around 40. We're just going to guess that. Mm -hmm. So now, if I want to predict, right? So some new day, I show up and I have well uh, three items in my cart. I want to predict the number of seconds. Then I'm going to say, OK, then I uh, will stand at 3, and I will find where this line is at 3. And where that line is at any point x is slope times x plus intercept, ax plus b. And so I just calculate that thing, and that's my prediction. So I expect if I have three items, I expect 49 seconds. If I have nine items, I have uh, 67 seconds. And if I have 25 items, I have 115 seconds, and so on. Right? The point is, you have developed a machine. Right? If you have a slope and an intercept, right? uh, and especially if your machine has calculated the slope and the intercept, the machine will spit out a prediction for you. Right? You just use that same thing over and over again. OK, so how did we come up with this line? Um, uh, so OK, here is, did you guys do function definitions at all? No? OK. So. Did you define functions in Python at all? Yeah. No. Well, cl clearly not with any great success. So. No. <laughs> okay, fine. So uh, the students know how, if you want to do something over and over again, you can define a function to do it. So if I give you these inputs, right. please give me back this output. right? And so they will have they've written a function that says, if I give you a table, and that's the x column, and that's the y column, and here's a slope and here's an intercept, please give me back the predicted value. All right, so what, okay. So, and I'm just gonna run a few cells and I'm gonna ask you not to, what has happened here is, it's the same scatter diagram. Uh, at every point, at every x that we have, we have computed three times, three times x plus 40. Right? And we have drawn that, and that is pretty much the same as what was given to us by fit line here. Right? So if we chose a slope of 3 and an intercept of 40, then we got the picture that we got. However, we could have chosen some other slope and some other intercept. And so we have to choose which is the best pair of slope and intercept that we should use. Um, and so again, Ignoring code. OK. Same scatter diagrams, same line, uh, slope 3 and intercept 40. Um, now, the points aren't on the line. Right? The points are off the line. Some of them are pretty close, but most of them are off. So for every point, I mean, if you're making a prediction, right, there's some error that you have made for that point. And for four of the selected points, four selected points, we have shown you five, is it? One, two, three, four, five. For five selected points, we have shown you the error. Right? The error is the height of the actual point minus the height of the line. Right? So there's the uh, length of the red segment. So you agree that every point corresponds to some error? Mm -hmm. And a natural way to think about a best line is a line that somehow minimizes those errors. Right now, you're minimizing a big set, and so you have to understand what that means. Right, so we're minimizing the rough size of the error. Well, uh, let's try and take a look. If we took a different line, this is slope one and intercept seventy. 
Same scatter diagram. If we use this line, you would get a huge error for this point, right? Small mm -hmm. errors for this one. So you would do better here, but you would do much worse here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you were for some reason very bizarre and wanted to put a <laughs> downward sloping line, you can, you know, and you can, then you would get massive grade errors, right? And so what you're trying to do is to minimize the size of the error. So naturally, you want to get a sense of what is the rough size of the error. And so roughly, well, you take the average of the errors, bad things are going to happen. Because why? Because some errors are plus and some errors are minus, and they're going to cancel out. And then you're not going to know how big anything is. So you have to get rid of the sign of the error. You want to know how big, not whether up or down, right? So what do you do with how big? Well, there are two time-honored ways in mathematics. You either drop the sign entirely absolute value, right? Or you square. We will have gone through this uh, uh, in case of standard deviation before. Um, and so uh, we will square these errors and take the average of those squared errors and try to minimize that. So error, squared error to get rid of the sign, mean squared error to combine all of those squared errors, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's great. It's a positive number. It's a miss because the y-axis is in seconds, mm -hmm. yes? The, average, the line is in seconds. Mm. The errors are in seconds. When you square them, suddenly you've got squared seconds, <laughs> and nobody in their right mind understands that. Mm -hmm. So you then take the square root again. You take the root of the mean squared errors to get back to seconds. Right? So root mean squared error RMSE uh, is what we're going to minimize. OK, uh, so Eric, I need about five minutes to finish this. Can I, yeah. Yeah, can I take yeah, yeah. the five? Yeah. Yes. Right, yes. to come to the end of the story and then we can break. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Sorry, weirdest I... thing is like that mm -hmm. clock is like seven minutes off. That clock is off. Yeah. Yes, so they, 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 I'm ignoring that. Do what you need. Said. No, no, no. I'm a Berkeley professor. I know what to ignore. <laughs> 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 okay. So, what we have to do is we have to calculate for every line, every point has an error, right? So we're going to calculate the root mean squared error for every single line, right? And find which line gives us the minimum. Where we're praying that there is one, right? So uh, before I actually do the calculation, uh, is there a, is the reason for calculating this uh, this thing reasonably clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. So <laughs> here is. OK, so here is the function, um, plot root mean squared error. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, so the data are these points. This is my checkout table. I am going to provide this uh, function with a slope and an intercept. So I'm going to pick an arbitrary line, right? And it's the job of this function to calculate the root mean squared error of that line and show me the picture. Okay, And so. Uh, <coughs> X is the items, number of items column, Y is the time column, and then there is a, uh, these are the points on the line, and now, the actual time column minus the fitted value, the values on your line, that's the error, square the error, yes, and then take the mean of those. Oh, the double star is a square, right? So you've calculated here the mean squared error, hence MSE. And the function returns the square root of that, getting back into seconds. The root mean squared error. And so I am just going to see what happens for this. Uh, I'm sorry, the double star means square? Power. Square. Power. Power. Okay. Raised power. power. Raised to the power. Uh, in R, it's a, in the R and LaTeX, it's a carrot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, when we look at our awful line, actually first. Okay, 
So uh, it, we took the slope to be minus two, we took the intercept to be 180, and the root mean squared error came out to be 98.77. If you just look at one root mean squared error, you have no idea whether it's big or small. Right, so you need to compare with something. And yeah. Is that value in seconds, or what is that, the 98.7, or is that a percentage? 98.77 seconds. Second, it is seconds. It is seconds. seconds. Yeah. Uh, that taking the root got me back to seconds. Okay. Interpret that. I'm sorry. I know you're. The, 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 to you're interpret sorry. that, what I'm saying is that all of these red segments, and I've mm -hmm. only drawn four of them, but every single point has a red segment. Mm -hmm. That 98.77 is the rough length of those red segments mm -hmm. for the entire data. For the entire data. Correct. We're going to be off by about well, 98. Correct. Okay. Well, it's just using well, that line, though. Kind of but it is an average. It is an average. An average, yes. an average thing. Yeah, so it's not a simple average, right? It is the average of these squares mm -hmm. for reasons that we talked about. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, so uh, the, uh, the average is one way to get to a rough size of a data set, right? It is not always the best way when your data set has both positive and negative values. So the root mean square is another commonly used way to get a sense of the size of data where the data have both plus and minus values. Typically, those are errors. Mm -hmm. But are there yeah. plus and minus values in the error here? Yes. There are. Uh, these errors are positive. Everything above the line gives you Just a positive error. Just because you error. use that line, I see. Yes. Errors are all, the errors for this picture are errors away from that line, okay. that awful line that I've drawn. Yeah, the awful yeah. Right? Okay, so the rough size of the error here for this bad line is 98.77. This line was a little bit better, right? And the root mean squared error is 38 and a bit. And the line that we had is, well, okay. So we guessed slope of three and we guessed an intercept of 40. Mm -hmm. And that line gives us a root mean squared error of 24.75, uh, sorry, 24.95, which is smaller than all the others we've seen. Okay, and so that line minimizes the root mean squared error, and also therefore it minimizes the mean squared error. Often you hear uh, it's the least squares line. Um, and so how do we go about finding this? Well, I just we had the gasp. I'm like, yeah. wait, OLS. OLS, <laughs> ordinary least squares. That's the one, ordinary least squares, no waiting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's all about errors. Uh, you've got natural value minus prediction, some are plus and some are minus, so to measure the rough size of the errors, you square them, you take the mean, you take the root. And so for every line, you have a root mean squared error. And your best line is the one that minimizes those root mean squared errors. And so now, how do you do that? Well, we put in the bunches of slopes and intercepts, but we've got a computer. We ask the computer to do that for us, right? So what we are going to do, numerical, we are going to use a numerical minimization method. And uh, the function is called minimize. It is our version of one of the optimization functions uh, that Python already has. And what it does is it takes as its input a function that we have defined, right? So we define the function that calculates the root mean squared error. Uh, and that function has uh, two inputs. That has the slope and the intercept. What minimize will do is it will do what we wish we were able to do, which is put in every possible value of the slope and every possible value of the intercept, <laughs> calculate the root mean squared error, and find us the smallest one. Now, of course, it can't do it exactly, uh, but it does a pretty darn good approximation. Okay, so if we do that, uh, I just want to show you quickly how minimize works. So supposing you have just some dumb function like this, and you're trying to find where it's at a minimum, well, you can clearly see it's a minimum is at three. Yep. Uh, so how minimize will work is you define a function, f of x, that returns this value, y, x minus 3 cubed plus 1. Uh, and just check that the function is doing the right thing. Yeah, the function, you just check, do you have the right values for, uh, for uh, the function? If you say minimize this function, that's what you're saying. 
minimize this function. What's f? f is this. For every x, it gives me back this number, right? If you say minimize f, let's see what happens. You get 3. You get 3. In other words, you get the point at which f is at a minimum, right? You get the input for which the output is at a minimum. Yeah? So what we are going to do is we are going to define a function called root mean squared error that takes a slope and intercept as its input. And we're going to say minimize that. And what we are hoping is that Python will give back to us the slope and the intercept that give us the smallest possible mean squared error. So if we do that, Um, oh, I should say, it is important to note, and we have to always point this out to students, that the function is giving me the point where the function is at a minimum, not the minimum value of the function. Mm -hmm. It is giving me a point on the horizontal axis, 3. It is not giving me the value of f at 3. If you want the minimum value of the <coughs> function, you better evaluate the function at that point. Right? So if you evaluate the function at 3, then you will get 1. Right? But the point to so know is that you're getting the value of the input, not the output. Mm -hmm. okay. So here we go. We will define a function, root mean squared error. It's going to take two arguments, any slope, any intercept. Right? And what we're going to do is this, this, these are x and y's. These have been our x and y's throughout. And the fitted value is going to be at this point, at these x's, the line that is determined by the input slope <coughs> and intercept. And then we are, what are we returning? Actual value minus fitted value squared. Take the mean of that, take the square root. This is the root mean squared error. So we do that. <coughs> and uh, I'm actually going to go to minimize this root mean squared error. I'm going to call it best. Okay, so what is best? Slope of regression line. Intercept of regression line. Remember, we had guesstimated 3 and 40 by i. So actually, it's 2.935 and 40.43 by uh, uh, numerical minimization. And just to finish off, I will say that we now have two ways of arriving at this line. For an oval scatter diagram, we already know what it is. You convert x to standard units, multiply by r, and you, you're there. Yep. We also have a way numerically. What I would like to show you is what the students check. The students at this point have a whole slew of functions that they have written. Right? They have written how to convert something to standard units. Right? Based on that, they have written how do you calculate the correlation. Based on that, they have written how do you calculate the slope. Based on that, how do you calculate the intercept? How do you get the fitted values? All of these. They, so the students write all that. In a typical class, this would be written with summation signs, but we don't bother with all that. Right? We just calculate. We just, the student just writes all of this. And what I'm going to do is I am going to show you if you use this formula that is from uh, what we really guessed by looking at the oval scatter diagrams, right? the slope that we would have calculated is this number, 2.9356. Let's see how it ca compares with what we got here. We got 2.9356. The formula that we discovered for the oval, mm -hmm. if we just plop it in here for this thing that is not an oval, we get the same slope. And let's just check something else. If we plop in our intercept formula based on the oval, in this case, which is clearly not an oval, we get 40.43. Let's just take same thing. Right? So why are we doing this twice? It is important for the students to understand the regression effect. 
they have to understand why that term and that dampening factor, right? So they have to thoroughly understand the oval, the, the case in which you can see what is going on, right? They have to note that that is particular to one shape and that not all shapes are like that and that they, they have the tools to get the best line for any shape. Then they have to note that, you know, the same equation works in both cases, right? And at that moment, they're saying why, and we're telling them, take that idiot, <laughs> <laughs> right? We leave cliffhangers, right? So that the students are itching to figure out what is going on here. The other thing is more crucial for data analysis. Look at this minimize. Does it care what this function is? It doesn't. All it cares is that function takes numerical inputs, right? So we decided to put in, we have one variable, we have the number of items, right? So we have some slope times number of items uh, plus intercept, right? If you have number of items as well as time of day or some other variable that you want to use, right? Then you can have one slope times number of items plus some different slope times time of day plus an intercept, mm -hmm. right? And you can create your prediction using two variables or three, or if you want to go crazy, 17, how <laughs> many, right? And you can get your prediction. And then it's the same game. You have an error and you can minimize the root mean squared error and suddenly you've done multiple regression. Right, with no change whatsoever, no matrices, no nothing. Right, and so if you want to fit a quadratic, you can do that too, because one of your variables is x and the other one's x squared. Right, so suddenly the student has a lot of power. Now, we don't actually go into multiple regression because I refuse to teach multiple regression without having a conversation about when not to do it. <laughs> right, and to, you know, to look at the relations between the variables that you're including and so on, but the student can if they wish, right? And that is the reason for doing the numerical as well as the graphical visual. All right, now I really will stop. The coffee is getting cold. Thank you. Thank you. Right? So, so I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking. So the, the RMSE is just basically to get a better slope line? I mean. The RMSE is to get a sense of how much error you're making. To make sense of how much error. Yes, to get one number that encapsulates how much error you are making. Yeah, it's interesting for my simple biology stuff that the students like want to do these RMSE, they want to do all this stuff, and it doesn't really help them for the calculations. But obviously, they're picking it up from you and from the other stuff class. Yes. So they, they come up with this idea. I'm like, really, all you need is the slope to calculate the unknowns. But they want to do more complicated things. Interesting. Yeah, but if you already have the slope, then you don't need to go through. Thank but you. it I might still be worthwhile see. to see if you use that slope. How much error do you make? Yeah. In which case you should use the RMSE of that line. Yeah, if you need it. Right? To. And yes. so if, if a student says, you know, I prefer to use another line, yeah. then they should compute the RMSE of that. And if yeah. they beat you, they should be using that line. <laughs> if it worked uh, better, if, it would be great. If it worked better, it would be great. <laughs> yes, this is what I tell my students. If you can find something better, that would I'm be like, wonderful. If it actually yeah. worked better, that would be great. But instead, it's just like, it doesn't really necessarily get better answers. It's